Hello, my friends. Welcome back as we're continuing our sermon series on the generational blessings and curses. Last week, we looked at Exodus 32 through 34, and we find that the children of Israel have really angered God. They have broken it in the covenant with God to be his people so soon after he gives them the Ten Commandments and makes a covenant with them. It's been less than 40 days and the people are dancing around a golden calf and God is just hurt and he's angry and he tells Moses, get up and go take the people, your people that you brought out of Egypt and leave. And Moses goes on a journey of intercessory prayer. He intercedes for the people and he pleads with God and he says, God, I don't wanna go unless you come with us. Finally, God relents and says, okay, Moses, I will personally go with you. And Moses isn't quite happy with that yet. So Moses says, God, if I've truly found favor with you, and you, if you're really gonna come with us, then show me your glorious presence. And God says, okay, I'll show you my presence, but you can't handle all of me, Moses. So what I'll do is I'll put you in the rock up there, I'll cover you with my hand, and then I'll pass by. So Moses goes up on the mountain as God directs, and God puts him in the rock, and as he's passing by, God, talks about himself while Moses gets to see through God's hand the light and the glory of God. And here's what God says about himself in Exodus chapter 34. He says, I am Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger, filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin. That I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon the children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations. As we studied this last week, we really began to wrap our heads around the fact that these generational blessings that go on for thousands of generations is God's love. It's who he is. It's what he wants to lavish on us. But God being just and merciful will never force his blessings on us. So if we do not submit our sinful selves to God, then we will reap the consequences of sin in our lives. And those consequences have effects in our family. So this is not talking about whether or not we can be saved and if I'm gonna pass down unsalvation to my kids. This is talking about my sinful nature and when I allow God into my life, how he's able to do amazing things for thousands of generations. But when I don't let God into areas of my life, how I pass down my sinfulness and my sinful traits, that could lead to people not being saved because it could lead people away from God. And so our sins have impact. And God in his love and his mercy is never going to force himself on us. We always get a choice. And so we're going to look at how that all plays out a little bit through the story of Abraham and his life. So we're going to start looking at his story in Genesis chapter 12. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 12, and we're going to read starting in verse 1. The Lord said to Abraham, Leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So we start this story here because we need to understand that God has a call in each and every one of our lives. And so as we're looking at the story of Abraham, we're going to look at the blessings and curses. We need to understand that we're not looking at this big sinful man who's just full of all these curses and that's why he passes down sin. No, we're actually looking at the father of God's people, the father of the Jewish nation, Abraham. And God calls him, he sees him, um, and he says, hey, Abraham, I want you to get up and go. And what he's asking of Abraham is no small feat. He says, I want you to leave your country, I want you to leave your family, and I want you to go to a place I haven't even told you about yet. You just need to get up and go, and I'll tell you on the way. We're gonna take this journey together. And why in the world does God choose Abraham? Why does he um, call Abraham out? Well. Here's what it says in verse four. So Abraham departed as the Lord had instructed and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he left Haran. He, so he took his wife, his nephew and all his wealth, his livestock and all the people that he had taken into his household at Haran and headed to the land of Canaan. When they arrived, Abraham traveled through the land as far as Shechem. There he set up camp beside the Oak of Morah. At the time, the area was inhabited by the Canaanites. So as we keep reading, why did God choose Abraham? Well, it tells us when God calls Abraham to do this big thing, 
to not just something small. Hey, Abraham, I want you to give up this in your diet. Or Abraham, I need you to adjust this thinking. No, he says, Abraham, I want you to change everything. I want you to get up and leave your father's um, house. I want you to leave your country, the people you know. And it's not like Abraham was a young man in his early 20s who had all this um, life ahead of him. No, he's 75 when God calls him to do this. Abraham was well established. He had lots of wealth. He had a family system. And so this was a big undertaking for Abraham. So why did God choose him? God chose him because when God tells Abraham to do it, Abraham gets up and does it. And so as we're looking at Abraham's life, we see that Abraham has a relationship with God. He has this love for God and he has this willingness to be obedient to God. And so my friends, just because someone has a relationship with God and a willingness to be obedient to God doesn't mean that every aspect of their life has been completely surrendered and given to God. And sometimes we feel like if I'm just good enough Christian or I have to be a good enough Christian in order for God to love me. No, but Abraham, and we're going to see, Abraham messes up some pretty big ways in his life. But that's not the point. The point is Abraham was willing to go. And Abraham gets up and goes without direction other than get up and go. He knows he's headed towards Canaan, but God hasn't told him where to go. And so Abraham gets up, he takes his family and they head out. There's an obedience in Abraham that is key. And as we're trying to understand the generational blessings and curses, we need to understand that God's love and his blessing goes on for thousands of generations if we love God and let him in. And so to start with, Abraham has this. He's going to pass on blessings for thousands of generations. In fact, God says, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you and everyone on earth will be blessed because of you. Ultimately, through Abraham's line, Jesus is born because of Abraham's willingness to lean into God. That is a generational blessing that goes thousands of generations and it goes into eternity because Jesus comes and he um, rescues all of us from our sins. And so Abraham gets up and goes. And here's what he does. So Abraham gets up and goes and he's obedient to God. Let's keep reading in verse seven. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, I will give this land to your descendants. And Abraham built an altar there and dedicated it to the Lord who had appeared to him. After that, Abraham traveled south and he set up camp in the hill country with Bethel to the west and Ai to the east. There he built another altar and dedicated it to the Lord and he worshiped the Lord. Then Abraham continued traveling south by stages towards the Negev. So what we see is Abraham is willing to get up and go, but he develops this lifestyle of building altars. He develops a lifestyle of connecting with God. Everywhere he goes, he seems to build an altar. Even though Abraham has this lifestyle of following God and setting up altars and being obedient to God, he is not perfect. And very shortly after God calls him and sends him, we find a first incident of Abraham doing things his own way. In Genesis 12, verse 10, it says, At that time, a severe famine struck the land of Canaan, forcing Abraham to go to Egypt, where he lived as a foreigner. As he was approaching the border of Egypt, Abraham said to his wife, Sarah, Look, you are a very beautiful woman. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife. Let's kill him. Then we can have her. So please tell them that you're my sister. Then they will spare my life and treat me well because of their interest in you. And sure enough, when Abraham arrived in Egypt, everyone noticed Sarah's beauty. When the palace officials saw her, they sang her praises to Pharaoh, their king, and Sarah was taken into his palace. Then Pharaoh gave Abraham many gifts because of her, sheep, goats, cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. But the Lord sent terrible plagues upon Pharaoh and his household because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So Pharaoh summoned Abraham and accused him sharply. What have you done? He demanded. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister and allow me to take her as my wife? Now then, here's your wife. Take her and get out of here. Pharaoh ordered some of his men to escort them, and he sent Abraham out of the country along with his wife and all of his possessions. Abraham has this lifestyle of loving God, but when famine strikes, when hard times happen, it doesn't tell us that Abraham builds an altar, but Abraham goes to Egypt. He's kind of decided how he's going to deal with this famine himself. It doesn't appear that he's consulted God. And then he is very concerned because he has a very real blessing that he is very concerned about. His wife is beautiful and she is gorgeous and he is worried about his life. 
He's forgetting that God told him to go. He's forgetting that God has already promised that he would bless him and that he would be a great nation and the whole world would be blessed through him. He is forgetting all these things. And so Abraham acts in his sinful nature, in his doubt. He acts by taking care of it himself, first by going to Egypt and second by telling Sarah to lie for him. And so Sarah lies and says, I'm your sister. Well, it's not a full lie, it's a half lie because she really was his sister, his half sister. They had the same father, but different mothers, you know, so it was kind of true. The point was, is Abraham was seeing a problem. And instead of processing with God how to take care of that problem, Abraham decides to fix it for himself. This is something that runs through Abraham's family and it becomes a problem through the generations moving forward. And we'll look at that as we continue to go forward. Well, you would think after you know God rescues Sarah from Pharaoh that Abraham would have learned his lesson. But it appears that Abraham has not quite given God access to this area of his life. And so it continues. This is a hard lesson to learn. And Abraham still struggles with it like many of us do. We struggle with you know, fully giving God access to all areas of our life. Fast forward 10 years, God meets Abraham in Genesis 15 and he promises him again that I will make you a great nation. And Abraham says, but how? I don't have any kids. And God re-ups his promise that you will have uh, be a great nation, that I'm gonna bless the world through you. Well, in Genesis 16, it's difficult. It says, now Sarah, Abraham's wife, had not been able to bear children for him. But she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarah said to Abraham, The Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abraham agreed with Sarah's proposal. So Sarah, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and gave her to Abraham as his wife. This happened 10 years after Abraham settled in the land of Canaan. It has been 10 years that God has been promising that Abraham would be a great nation, but he still has no kids. This is a very real problem. And so Abraham, again, listens to Sarah and they decide to solve their own problems. And you see, when we don't trust God in his fullness, we take away his ability to give us this unfailing love and grace for thousands of generations. Instead, we heap the curses on ourselves. Abraham and Sarah are looking at conventional human wisdom. They're looking at the culture of the day, which said, you know, if you can't have kids, take another wife. The other wife can have kids and those can be your kids and then you can have descendants. This was never part of God's plan. God knew that it was only one man, one woman. That was his plan for a family. And having multiple wives only causes problems. It's never a good thing. And Abraham does not consult God. There's no altar talked about here. He just thinks it's a good idea because Sarai, his wife, presents it to him and she's probably the only one who could have brought it up. And so Abraham goes through with this. Well, what happens? So Abraham had sexual relations with Hagar and she became pregnant. But when Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to treat her mistress Sarai with contempt. Then Sarah said to Abraham, this is all your fault. I put my servant in your arms, but now she's pregnant and she treats me with contempt. The Lord will show who's wrong, you or me. Abraham replied, look, she's your servant, so deal with her as you see fit. Then Sarah treated Hagar so harshly that she finally ran away. All right, what happened? This is not God's plan. This is not God's plan at all. And as soon as Hagar gets pregnant, she starts thinking that she's better than Sarai. And now there's competitions between the wives. And so Sarai, who's the first wife, goes to Abraham and says, this is all your fault. You took a wife. And it was actually her that had suggested the whole thing. But you see, when we sin, it's not just us that's affected. The whole family is affected. Everyone around us is affected when we sin, when we don't trust God. And it is hurt. Sarah is hurt. Um, Hagar gets hurt because Abraham says, okay, Sarah, she's your servant. Well, technically she wasn't supposed to be a servant anymore. She was now a wife. She should have wife status. But no, um, Abraham says, no, she's your servant. And so now Sarah treats her harshly. This is not what a godly woman would be doing. But you see, sin compounds sin and adds to sin and makes it worse. And everyone is affected and everyone is hurt.
And so um, Hagar finally runs away. We're not gonna read the rest of the story, but the beautiful thing is, is even though Hagar didn't have a choice in all of this, she is sinned against, she is given without her permission, and she's treated harshly and she's pregnant. God sees her and God blesses her. But if we're looking at Abraham's story, we see this perpetuation of the sin. We see how as Abraham and Sarah are not trusting God, as they're doing it their own way, they are causing problems. Well, Ishmael is born and he becomes the cherished child for 13 years. But there's still this brokenness in Sarai because God had never intended for them to solve their problems their way. He was calling them to trust him and to trust him that he would come through on his promises. But you see, when we don't trust God in his fullness, when we don't see him, when our brokenness comes in, the sin impacts us and it impacts our family. And it can have generational impact as we see the hurt that is caused and the rift that is caused between Ishmael and Isaac goes on for generations because many people don't allow God to come in and heal that rift. And so there is pain that is caused. But you see, that wasn't God's plan. In spite of the fact that Abraham decided he was going to solve his problems his way, God still had an ultimate plan and an ultimate purpose. And his plans hadn't changed. And his plan was to lavish unfailing love through thousands of generations. So now, now that Abraham and Sarah understand the folly of their ways and the impact that it has had to run ahead of God, you would have hoped they would have learned their lesson. Well, fast forward about 10 years again, and God shows up to Abraham and um, he he processes with Abraham that Sodom and Gomorrah are going to be destroyed. But before he does that, he reaffirms his promise to make Abraham a great nation. And this time he explicitly says that Sarah is going to have a baby next year at this time. Sarah at this point laughs and God says, why did Sarah laugh? And she's like, I didn't laugh. This whole thing happens. Well, then what happens next? In um, Genesis chapter 20, Abraham gets on the move again, and now he's worried about Sarah being taken captive again. So he tells Sarah to lie again. Like history is repeating itself. God promises, I'm going to make you a great nation. Then they're on the move, and Abraham tells Sarah to lie, and she gets taken. Well, this happens again, this time with Abimelech. And Abimelech is taken, and God speaks to Abimelech and says, no, 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 that lady's married. Don't you do anything to her. All your you know, women are infertile until you give her back. This whole story repeats itself. Abraham has not learned his lesson. He doesn't seem to understand that God can fight for him, that God can take care of himself. So when given the opportunity to trust God's promise that Sarah's going to have a baby, to trust that he will be a great nation through Sarah, to trust that God can take care of his wife, Sarah, no, he decides to lie. And Abimelech takes Sarah as his wife, but ultimately gives her back. Well, Sarah does get pregnant, and this is a God thing. It's a God miracle. It's God lavishing his unfailing love on us. Sarah gets pregnant, and she is really old when she gets pregnant. Let's continue the story in Genesis 21, verse 1. The Lord kept his word and did for Sarah exactly what he had promised to do. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son for Abraham in his old age. This happened at just the time God said it would, and Abraham named their son Isaac. Eight days after Isaac was born, Abraham circumcised him as God had commanded. Abraham was a hundred years old when Isaac was born. That means Sarah would have been about 90. Sarah declared, God has brought me laughter. All who hear about this will laugh with me. Who would have... Um, said Abraham and Sarah would nurse a baby and yet I have given Abraham a son in his old age. So God comes through in his promises. It's 25 years after God's promised it but God still came through on his promises and Sarah is seemingly surprised at it because it was impossible for humans to do but nothing is impossible for God. But she rejoices because they have a baby and so and the consequences of their sin are still impacting their lives. And here's how it's impacting their lives. We're going to continue reading in Genesis 22, verse 8. When Isaac grew up and was about to be weaned, Abraham prepared a huge feast to celebrate the occasion. But Sarah saw Ishmael, the son of Abraham, and her Egyptian servant, Hagar, making fun of her son. 
Isaac. So she turned to Abraham and demanded, get rid of the slave woman and her son. He is not going to share the inheritance with my son Isaac. I won't have it. This upset Abraham very much because Ishmael was his son. But God told Abraham, don't be upset over the boy and your servant. Do whatever Sarah tells you. For Isaac is a son through whom your descendants will be counted. But I will also make a great nation of the descendants of Hagar's son because he's your son too. So Abraham got up early the next morning and prepared food in a container of water and strapped them to Hagar's shoulders. Then he sent her away with her son and she wandered aimlessly in the wilderness of Beersheba. Abraham is called by God and he goes on this journey where he loves God and God talks to him. God keeps reaffirming the promise, but Abraham has this major trust issue with trusting God can actually do what he says and trusting God can take care of him and take, um, keep his promises. So Abraham keeps trying to fix it himself. He tells Sarah to lie. He takes Hagar as his wife so that she can have a son. But this was never God's plan. And this causes nothing but pain in their marriage, in their relationship, and in their family. Finally, God comes through on his promise because God's timing is perfect. It's not our timing. And we have to trust that God and his unfailing love knows the time things need to happen, knows the order that needs to happen. But God gives Abraham like a second try to trust him. And Abraham fails again. He lies about Sarah to Abimelech. And then um, when Sarah does have a baby, they would think that everything's good now. The problem is, is the disobedience and the sin from their past is still there. Now hear me out. Hagar and Ishmael are not the sins. They are. Um, they were actually hurt because of Abraham and Sarah's sin to disobey God. They were hurt and they are not being punished and there's nothing wrong with them. But it was never God's ideal to have more than one wife. It was never God's way to have us solve our problems or for us to fulfill God's promises for us. We need to trust God to do that. By running ahead of God, they cause hurt in their family and they do damage to the people that they were trying to get to solve their problems. So Hagar is hurt by this, Ishmael's hurt by this. When Sarah has Isaac, Ishmael's probably very jealous. For 13 years, he had been the only son and now Here's Isaac, and he's the son of the first wife, and he's the son of the promise that God had made. So Ishmael makes fun of Isaac, and Sarah doesn't want anything to do with this. And so she confronts Abraham. She's like, I've had enough. Get rid of them. No, I don't want Ishmael here anymore. I don't want Hagar here. They're not going to have anything to do with God's promise to Isaac. And Abraham is now paying fully for the consequences of his sins. His sins in running ahead of God means that he now has a son that is being hurt. He now has um, this, his son's mother, Hagar, who's being hurt. Sarah is hurt. Isaac is hurt. Everyone is hurt because of this. And Sarah says, send her away. And Abraham goes to God. And to his credit, he goes to God because this is an impossible situation when we are reaping the consequences of our sin. And God says, no, Sarah's right, send her away. Because God had never ordained multiple wives. He never ordained that, that was never part of his plan. And so even though Hagar is sent away because she was not supposed to be there, it's not that she did anything wrong and that Hagar and Ishmael are bad because God actually says, I'm gonna bless Ishmael because he's your son too. He's gonna become a great nation. And they had their own journey and their own opportunity to lean into God and to trust God. And we find out later that Abraham stays in contact with Ishmael. He, he gives him an inheritance before Abraham dies and leaves everything to Isaac. They stay in contact, but you see, it was never meant for Abraham to have two wives. And he, Abraham was never meant to have a son with Hagar. And so when Abraham is called to fix his mistake, it hurts and it's hard and it's hard on everyone. And you see, that's one of the things that God is trying to teach us as we're looking at God and trying to understand him in his fullness. He's trying to let us know that the sins in our lives don't just impact us. They hurt everyone around us. 
But we need, also need to understand that because we have sin and because we hurt other people, it doesn't mean that we're not saved. And it doesn't mean that we're not in a relationship with God because this whole time God is in a relationship with Abraham and God is working on Abraham and God is giving him opportunity again and again and again to try. And he messes up a lot. And we haven't even talked about all of Abraham's story. But for today, what we're going to focus on is as God has called Abraham, he gives him these blessings and he comes through in these blessings. But because of Abraham's sinfulness and because he doesn't surrender everything to God, there's this generational curse that gets activated and it starts impacting the family here. And it is painful. And when Abraham tries to be a cycle breaker, when he tries to rectify his wrong because God tells him that was never my plan to have more than one wife, it is painful and it hurts all involved. And when we go about the process of trying to break the cycles of sin in our lives, I want you to know it's gonna be painful too. It's not easy. It's not going to be something that, okay, God, uh, I'll give you full access. No, it hurts when we have to deal with the consequences of our sin, when we have to um, try to make things right the way that God made them right. And you see, what we need to understand is God does not abandon Hagar and he does not abandon Ishmael. You know, God sees Hagar at the well. Hagar names him the God who sees me. God is with them too. But it was never part of God's plan that Hagar and Ishmael be part of Abraham's story. And because Abraham sinned and ran ahead of God, there is pain. And there has been pain through the generations because of that between the two families. And so my friends, as we're diving into this story, I really want us to understand from Abraham's story that God had a call in Abraham's life. And even though he was a man of God, he still sinned. And because of his sins, there is consequences and impact for the whole family. But ultimately, Abraham gets around to responding to God and doing what he should have done, which was trust God. And when God said, send Hagar away, he sends her away, even though it is hard and painful. My friends, if you're watching this, I hope that you are someone who loves God, but we all have the Hagars in our lives. We all have our sinful things. We all have the sins in our lives that we haven't given God access to. And I want to let you know that God is going to keep working on us. He's going to keep coming and keep giving us opportunities to trust him. And when we finally get there, even though it will be right, it might be painful to work through. But don't give up hope. We're going to pick up next week with the call of Isaac. And the call of Isaac has to do with the final test in Abraham's life. So let's keep studying this family together. But as we do, I just want to know what has God said to you as we process these passages today, as we've done this really quick overview in Abraham's life. What has God said to you about the blessings and curses in your life and how you should respond? I would love to know. Please grab your connection cards. You can do that by texting the letter CC to 301-321-8848. And let me know what did God say to you as we process these passages? And second, how are you going to respond to God? That is what he wants. As we get to know him, as we hear his voice, he wants a response from us. So how are you going to respond to him? And lastly, how can we pray for you? Because I need your prayers. We need each other. We all need to be on this journey together. Let me pray for you right now. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for who you are and what you're doing in our lives. And Lord, thank you that even when we're your children, uh, because of the sinful world we live in, there's going to be sins that we need to wrestle with. Lord, I pray that you give me eyes to see what they are and a willingness to open and surrender them to you. Lord, allow healing to take place, even if it's painful on the journey. And Lord, I just pray that you bless each one within the sound of my voice right now. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. I want to thank you so much for worshiping with us today. This sermon would have aired at 6 o'clock on Friday night. And if you'd like to discuss this passage with us, we will be discussing it live on Saturday morning at 1130. You can join us either on Zoom by texting the word study to 301-321-8848. Or you can join us in person at our building at 14595 Avion Parkway. I sure hope you'll join us and I hope that you have a great time going on this journey with us as we study the generational blessings and curses.